All right, the title of the sermon this morning is How to Be a Blessing to Your Church. So we're thinking about anniversary today and the things that have happened over the years. Uh, but today we're talking about how to be a blessing to your church. I've got five things that I want you to think about this morning on if you want this church to be successful, if you want this church to grow, uh, five things that you can do to help be a blessing to this church. And hopefully, you know, you take ownership of your church, right? The church that you attend here today. So the verse I just want to point out from Matthew 12 is in verse 30. Jesus says, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And the principle that we learn here in Matthew 12, 30, is that in the Christian life, in the Christian battle, there's no middle ground. Some people think, well, you know, I'm not involved, I'm sort of sitting neutral, I'm neither doing so anything for Jesus, but I'm also not hindering either. You know, I'm, some, I'm in a, a neutral ground somewhere where I'm not having any positive effect, but no negative effect either. And what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 12, 30 is that there is no middle ground. He says here, he that is not with me is against me. So you see how it's not that he that is against me is against me. He's saying if you're not with me, then you're automatically against me. If you are not gathering with me, then you are scattering. So you may not be thinking, well, I am intentionally scattering, or I am intentionally having a negative impact. But if you are not having a positive impact, then your impact will be negative. That's what I want you to think about. So you're either helping or you're hindering. There's no middle ground in the Christian life. So if you're not moving forward, here's a newsflash for you, you're moving backwards. But if you are not moving forward, if you're not growing in your spiritual life, you are moving backwards. You know, that, that's the truth right there. So the same can be applied, you know, obviously it can be applied in your Christian life, but the same can be applied to your impact in a church. Right? If you're not helping your church, if you're not encouraging your church, then you're actually helping to discourage it. Right? And you don't want to be doing that. You want to be gathering with Jesus. You don't want to be scattering. So what are five things this morning I want you to think about that you can help to be a blessing to your church? Number one. Number one is be righteous. Be righteous. Obviously, all these things are easier said than done. But even before trying to live a righteous life, right? You need to be saved, right? It doesn't require righteousness to be saved. You simply put your faith on Jesus Christ. It's a free gift, right? So you need to be saved first because if you're not even saved without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please him, right? So you can't even be with Jesus if you're not even saved to begin with. So you need to be saved, put your faith on Jesus. But what do I mean by being righteous? You know, there's a saying in Christianity where you say, you don't have to be sinless, you just want to try and sin less, right? That's what being righteous is all about, it's about trying to sin less in your life. Obviously, we will never be sinless, right? But that's something you have to strive to do, it's not just going to happen. And if you, know, you want to be a blessing to your church, the sin in your life is going to have an impact on the people around you, even though you don't think so, right? Because, right, you're not gathering with Jesus Christ, you're scattering, right? If you're not encouraging, then you may be, you'll be discouraging. Hebrews 12.1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, look at this, and the sin which does so easily beset us, right? It holds us back, right? And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Remember, patience in the King James Bible is not just waiting, doing nothing. Right? Patience in the King James Bible is when you go through hard times. Right? You're, you're striving through trials and tribulations and you keep going with patience. That's why the Bible even talks about the tribulation at the end. That this is the patience of the saints. It's not that we're just waiting around doing nothing. It's that we are going through hard times. So it's not easy, this race. But you know what's going to make it even harder? Is the sin in your life, right? The sins in your life. And you see how it says here, let us lay aside every weight? Because sometimes weight in your life is not always sin. Sometimes you just have too many vain things in your life. And it's holding you back from running this race effectively. But you know what? Sin is going to do that too. Sin is going to hold you back from doing everything you could be for God and, and being the encouragement and the church member that you could be for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So some people with their sins are not, are not even concerned about their sins, right? And that's obviously a problem. You need to know if you have sins in your life, unrepentant sins in your life that you haven't gotten rid of or try, at least trying to get rid of, it's going to affect you, it's going to affect the people around you, it's going to have an impact on church as well. This is why in 1 Corinthians 5, you know, Paul deals with this subject of just like certain sins, rampant sins that are going on in church. And he uses fornication as a good example, one of the examples. 1 Corinthians 5, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. You know, every time I read this verse, I always think about those churches that don't implement these sort of policies, right? And just talk about how loving they are. You know, we're so loving. We used to welcome everyone. I remember a reporter asked me once, isn't, isn't everyone welcome at church? And it's like, no, because there are certain sins that are not welcome at church, certain behaviors that are not. Fornication is one of them. It says, yeah, puffed up and have not rather mourned. Right, so puffed up about what? I just think, like, oh, because we're so loving, we're so accepting. And not rather mourn that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan. So that's a phrase to basically excommunicate somebody. For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And this is the part I wanted to focus on just in this passage. We're familiar with this one. But uh, verse number six, your glorying is not good. Glorying in what? Glorying in your sins. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know, often when we think about people struggling with sins, we think about a few main areas, right? We may think of like, you know, sexual sins, whether it's fornication, pornography. You know, sometimes you've got um, money, right? Where people are covetous or they're just like so materialistic, um, greedy, maybe it's gambling, things like that. And then you have drugs where people you know, find it hard to you know, quit smoking or they're addicted to alcohol or other, other type of hard drugs or something, whatever drugs like they're trying to get, get out of their life. Now, why is this a big problem? Well, here, if you know what leaven is, leaven is the yeast in bread, and you know that if you know anything about bread making, once you put a little bit of leaven in that bread, it, it multiplies, and it affects the whole lump. Now, in this passage, you see in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. So the ye here is plural. Ye may be a new lump. So that's important. It's not that thou mayest be a new lump, because it's not talking about the individual, because the lump that it's talking about here, you think about lump of dough, it's talking about the church, right? And you see here when there's leaven in the church, it grows and it infects others, right? That's why sin can infect others, bad habits, can infect others, but you can even see attitudes can infect others as well. If you come to church and you're not on fire for God, you're going to help others be not on fire for God too. So we need to think about our impact and how we affect this church because, you know, the way we are, our example, is going to affect others, negative and positive. So some people are not even concerned about their sins and they should be, right? Because it can have a negative effect on the body of Christ. We need to strive, you know, you, I know um, some people may have this thought, and it's a wicked thought to think, well, if I'm saved, I'll just keep sinning anyway. Now, are you still saved if you keep on sinning? Yeah, you are still saved. But should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? So our attitude should be, no, we are saved from hell. Jesus died for my sins. I should strive in gratitude and in the commandment of my Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ to rid myself of these sins and to constantly grow and excel in the Christian life. So some people are not even concerned about their sins, and that's a problem. Others have sins in their life and it's holding them back. You know, it's holding them back from serving God. Maybe it's something you've done in the past that you're not proud of. Is that holding you back from God? Uh, doing great things in your life. And you know, with that situation, you go to 1 John 1, 9. The Bible says here, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, sometimes we are harder on ourselves than God is. You know, God wants to forgive us of our sins. God wants you to confess it, forsake it, and move on. You know, He's ready to move on. He's ready to forgive and to move on. And oftentimes, uh, our own sins hold us back. You know, sometimes we'll say to ourselves, oh, you know, God's not going to forgive me for this. God's not going to understand. You know, we have these thoughts, and we shouldn't. You know, because God is ready to forgive. If we just go to Him in faith and ask for forgiveness, He will forgive us. And our heart can be right with Him and we can continue to move on. Don't let it hold us back. So the first one is to be righteous. The sins in your life are going to affect the church. It's going to affect your work for Him as well. Second thing I want you to think about, how to be a blessing to your church. Number two is be committed. Be committed. Too many Christians are half in, half out. Right? Half in, half out. There's a story in the Bible about somebody that was half in and half out. I'll show you here if you're not familiar with it. Acts 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So he's preaching a long time. You think Victor preaches a long time. This is a, an even longer sermon. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. So you see the people that are paying attention at church, they're not usually sitting in a window, one foot in the world, one foot in church. And chances are when you're sitting in a window, you're probably getting distracted with the things of the world as well. So he's falling asleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft, was taken up dead. So some people think he actually died as opposed to just was really injured. Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him, said, trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten, talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. So why do people go to this passage when we talk about half in, half out. Because you know what? If you are half in and half out in the Christian life, you know what direction you're going to fall? You're going to fall out. So Eutychus didn't fall into the house, did he? You don't fall into the Christian life. You don't fall into doing what's right. But if you're half in, half out, you know what's going to happen? The direction you're going to fall, you're going to fall out, right? And you're going to hurt yourself like Eutychus did here, spiritually, right? So we don't want to be half in, half out Christians. We want to be committed we want to be committed to the cause of Christ. Look what Jesus says here. He wants us to be committed. And those who are lukewarm, the Bible talks about. And I love the analogy of just leaven in the church because lukewarm, you know when leaven spreads through bread, it spreads a lot faster. And it's just like that room temperature, that lukewarmness. And this is why it's dangerous for churches to be lukewarm as well. Sometimes it's better for people to just, you know, just cut out the leaven rather than just have it fester in a lukewarm church. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now a lot of people use this passage to teach that you can lose your salvation which is not right. What it's saying here is it just makes God sick. It makes God sick to see lukewarm Christians, lukewarm Christianity. That's what we're going to... We don't want to make God sick. I don't want to be a sour taste in God's mouth. I want, you know, I want my life to be pleasing to God, right? And a sacrifice pleasing to Him. Look at Paul here in 1 Thessalonians 2. Do we see here a half in, half out with Paul? When he serves the church, 1 Thessalonians 2 says, so, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, look, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. You see here, like Paul is giving it his all. He's not just putting in the minimum. So there's some commitment here. If you want to be a blessing to your church, you know, you want to take ownership of this church. You want to say, this is my church, right? This is not their church, not that church. It's my church, right? To be a part of and to grow and to be a blessing in. So be committed. You know, be early 
why don't you just be on time to church? Why don't you come early? And you can welcome people as they come to church. Be consistent. You know, some people, you look at their attendance at church, and it's like, well, here one week, not week, and then a month later, then they come, and then, you know, we're, we're not going to be a successful church if we don't have commitment from the people here. So you want to be consistent in your attendance. Take on responsibilities. You know, if you're not doing anything to help the church here, think about, hey, how can I help? There's plenty of things to help in. If you're wondering where you can help, let me know. I've got plenty of things uh, in the church that we can do. Another one being committed. You know, don't organize events at the same time as church. You know, some people have too many things. They have their, you know, birthday or whatever, and it's Sunday morning. Or you have, you know, Sunday afternoon where you have to, like, rush off straight away and things like that. You have things you want to get to on Sunday afternoons that make you rush off and not really spend time with the people here. You know, church should not just be a spiritual, like, tick-off list. I did that on Sunday. You know, you want to get to the point in your spiritual life where church is what you do on Sunday. You know how people have things they do on Sunday, but i got to go to church first. But what I really want to do, i got something I really need to do on Sunday. Church should be that thing you really need to do on Sunday. Right? And then that takes priority. So you want to be committed. Right? See, aren't you encouraged when you see a certain someone here, when you come to church and you like see the faces here, you think, oh, it's a blessing. Well, other people are thinking the same thing. So when you're not there, you see, that can be a discouragement when you're not at church. So just being here, just being at church and being a part of of the group here, you can be an encouragement and a blessing to the church. That's number two. Number three. <laughs> number three, so we talked about number one is be righteous. Number two is be committed. Number three, you want to be a soul winner. Be a soul winner. You know, I want you guys to get with the program. Right, you say, what is the program here, Victor? Well, let's read from Matthew 28. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That is known as the Great Commission. Preaching the gospel, baptizing people, teaching the Bible, teaching other people to then preach the gospel. That is the program at our church. That's the reason why we're here. Mark 16, 15. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So different people you know, come to our church for different reasons. And it's great that people come to our church you know, maybe they come just to make some friends, right? They want to come, meet some people, make some friends. And to them, it's a social club. But what I want you to remember today is that this church is not just a social club. And if that's all you think this church is contributing to you or that all you need to do here is just have a social scene, and you are missing the program. You're missing the point here. It is not just a Bible study. You say, well, I come to church, I talk to people about the Bible, I learn about the Bible from the preaching, but you know, our church is not here just to be a Bible study. Right? We are not just a group of activists worried about things going on in the political sphere. Right? and things that we are concerned about going on in our country. Now, do we like to get involved in those things? Yes. But is that what we are about? Is that the main program in our church? No. You know, we're not just a political think tank. You know, you get together, talk about political things, and it's kind of related to the social club. Our purpose is this. This is why we're here. This is... This is uh, this is the reason why we even exist. You know, if it wasn't for this, this church wouldn't even be here. Because why is this church planted in this area? It's to preach the gospel to the people in this area. 
Right? That's why we're here. And that's going to be the program. That's why you want to be a blessing to this church. Hey, I want you guys to get with the program. The program is preaching the gospel. And that's why you want to Victor Head's anniversary. Should we skip soul winning today and just relax and just socialize? No! Because why is our church even here? What are we celebrating? Six years of what? Six years of staring at each other and just talking about stuff? No, six years of gospel preaching. That's what we're celebrating. We're celebrating about the thousands of people, hundreds of people that have heard the gospel because of the soul winners in our church going out every week preaching the gospel. That's why it's great that this church has been around for six years. And it was just six years of just like social club. What's the point of that? You know? Well, the point of that is, is to make you more connected with everyone so that we'll go out and preach the gospel. That is the goal. That's why we're here. That's the purpose of our church. Other organizations have their mission statement. You know what the mission statement of the church in Liverpool is? It's to preach the gospel to every creature. It's to baptize them. Right? It's to teach them all things, whatsoever command you, so that they will be soul winners as well. That is my goal. That's what I'm always trying to think. How can we do this better? Soul winning, that's what we're about. That's what we'll always be about. That is the reason why we even exist. Because what is more valuable than souls in this life? What can we take to heaven? We can't take anything besides other people. Jesus said here, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. You see, many people chase things in this world, but really, when you think about it, what more valuable thing could you do in your life than try and win people to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, a lot of us put time and effort into things that are worth so much less. And the time and effort we put into Preaching the gospel, getting better at preaching the gospel. You know, don't just do your time. Oh, you know, I mentioned it to somebody there. You know, do you actually become an, a master of the trade that we're in, right, as Christians? The work of our Father, right? Getting into the vineyard. And we put more effort into our careers than we do into being children of God. So be a soul winner. That's number three. Number four, be a friend. Be a friend. So you want to be a blessing to your church? Be a friend. Right? And we want to distinguish between just being an acquaintance, just knowing somebody, which we would normally call an acquaintance, and being a, a friend. Proverbs 18. Look at how the Bible talks about true godly friendship. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Right? You want to have friends? You be friendly first. If your concern is people aren't friendly to me, you've got the wrong focus. Our focus is we want to be a friend. Not that we know, oh, it's nice to have more friends. But I'm talking about how you can be a blessing to the church. You be a friend. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So you can see how friends can even be closer than even family. Right? That's the sort of friend that we want to be to one another here. And I understand, you know, church is a large group of people. So I'm not expecting everyone to be close friends with everyone. But you want to be a close friend to people at church, right? And so, because once you have close friends, there's accountability there. There's encouragement. There's provoking unto love and to good works. So you want to strive to make as many friends as you can. But obviously, we only are capable of so much. And this is why it's so important that all of us do it. You know, I can't be 100% close to everyone in church. But you know what? If everyone has the mindset to be a friend to somebody in church, you know what? That's how all the joints together in our church will band together and we'll have a solid church here. So be a friend. Love one another. John 13, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. You see, we are known for our love to each other. We love one another. You know, loving one another doesn't just mean that you tolerate each other. You know, so eyes up here, guys. I know sometimes it's a bit, can be a bit distracting, but we suffer the little children. It's all right. But eyes up here. 
<laughs> what is love one another? Is love one another, we just tolerate one another? Because that's how some people think of like just love in the church. Yeah, we just put up with everyone and like yeah, I see them every week. I don't get along with them much when I talk to them. Just tolerate one another? No, you love one another. So love. What are some things that I had on my mind when I just think about loving each other in church? One is, why don't you learn each other's names? <laughs> That's like one. Sometimes like, I'll talk to somebody in church and they're just like, oh, that person, you know, that's their name. I'm like, you don't even like, when you introduce yourself, say hello, ask a bit about them. You know, how can you say you love your brethren when you don't even know who they are? You know, I'll say like, oh, it's that person. Who's that person? Oh, it's that family. Oh, I think I, yeah. Come on, guys. You got a loved one. Just learn each other's names. You know, to me, I know, you know, yeah, how, how many times do you hear people say, oh, I'm not good with names, I'm good with faces? You know why people say that? It's because they don't care enough to learn people's names. That's, that's not this. It's not this they're not good with names, but you're good with faces. It's because you don't take the effort to actually remember somebody's name. And I think it's something good to do. I try and do that, you know, when I go meet people, try and make an effort to, like, learn their name. It shows that you actually you know, care who they are. You remember that interaction. You try and learn their names. You say their names correctly as well. That's okay. So, learn each other's names. Learn more about each other. Listen to one another. You know, listen, learn, get to know people. And then you can know what to pray for. You know, you're praying for each person. You know, if you don't know the people in your church, chances are you're not praying for them. You want to be a blessing to your church. And Paul was so confident that the Philippian church would grow. Why? Because he was praying for them. You know, and we, we pray for the people in our church. Maybe we'll have more confidence that they will grow in the faith. So pray for one another. You know, give each other the benefit of the doubt. It's something so easy to have conflict in the church. You know, people saying things the wrong way. You know, give people the benefit of the doubt. They don't always mean ill by what they do or what they say. And then you know, you'll be more of a friend. You know, that's, that's really like when you think about your close friends, isn't it like that? Like your, your, your close friend can say whatever they want. You don't take it personally. You argue about things. It's not personal. But then it's because you're being a friend. But when you're not being a friend, oh, what do they mean by that? I can't believe they said that. Do they... I mean, this, you, always, you don't give them the benefit of the doubt that they are just trying to not be offensive. You're, you're getting offended so easily. 1 John 3 says here, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we want to show your love for people. Often what you do speaks a lot louder than what you say. Right? Now, everything we do in life you know, requires relationship building. The more you realize in life how important relationships are, you know, the more you'll focus on building strong relationships or having skills to keep relationships well. You know, they say, like, how do you go along with somebody if you can't get along? Right, so you want to be able to get along with people so they can do more uh, for the Lord together. And, you know, conflict is very destructive in any group, just like it is in church. That's why it's so important for us to love one another and to get along, because if we don't, then... You all right, Pete? No. <laughs> what did you do? All good? <laughs> Spider. <laughs> all right. So conflict, just like, they can be like spiders, you see? They just like disrupt everything, right? And it's just like the schism in the body. <clears throat> so we don't want conflict. And this is why we need to learn to love one another. Right? We love one another, then, you know, this conflict doesn't destroy the church. Right? So you want to be a blessing? Learn to be a friend. Learn to get along with other people. Learn to give people the benefit of the doubt. Learn to love and pray for one another. Galatians 5.13, look at this. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Liberty, right? We have liberty in Christ. This means like not everything's commanded in our life. We have choices in our Christian life. But look at what it says here when we think about the freedoms we have in the Christian life. 
Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? That's the golden rule. But look at this, verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Isn't it interesting the analogy there of just the conflict within a church is like cannibalistic. You know, we don't, it's like, why, it's like, well, you know, people say, who needs enemies when you have friends like these? You know, people say like that. We don't want that to be true of church, right? To think like, well, who needs an enemy when we have, when we have enough strife going on in church? How are we going to fight against an enemy if we're too busy fighting one another? And this is why it's so important. The program in our church is about soul winning, right? We have that united goal to reach the world. Hopefully, that'll make people put their minor differences aside and do great things for God together for a greater purpose. So be a friend. Be a friend. And the last one I want to talk about, so we have be righteous. Be committed. Be a soul winner. You know, be a friend. And the last one I want to talk about this morning is be a teacher. Be a teacher. Now, before you teach anyone anything, you need to know what you're talking about first, right? So, obviously, you don't want to go around teaching things you don't know about or, like, teaching things that are in contradiction <laughs> to the beliefs of our church, right? Teach things that are in opposition to what we stand for here. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God of truth. 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So you can see here, scripture is great. It tells you what is right. For reproof, it tells you what's wrong. For correction, it tells you how to make it right and for instruction in righteousness, it tells you how to keep it right. It was something I was taught, I thought, it's just a great way to see the different aspects of God's Word there. And you see, if you know God's Word, you can be a blessing because you can help teach people what is right. You can help teach people what is wrong. You can help teach people how to make it right. And you can help teach people how to keep it right. But if you don't know the Word, how are you going to help be a blessing? To somebody else in church that may need help. Because one thing I want you guys to understand is you say, Victor, you're saying be a teacher, but in this church you don't allow women to preach. Preach preachers aren't allowed to be women, and that is true. But what I want you to understand is the pulpit is not the only place that teaching happens in this church. Right? Yes, it is a it is only something for men to address the whole congregation. But it's not only for men to teach others within the church, right? We're talking about teaching, we're teaching the whole congregation. That's where women should not be teaching the whole congregation. But do women teach? They do. Do we teach in our lives? I'm not saying necessarily you need to be like a you know, Bible teacher at church. I just mean in your life, learn the Bible so that you can help others learn the Bible as well. It's like going soul winning. Don't just go soul winning. You want to think about, hey, if I take somebody with me soul winning, I'm going to share some thoughts. Like, hey, this is how, what I'm thinking about when I introduce. This is how I think about when I'm preaching the gospel. You know, reflect on the door that just happened. This is how you, you become a teacher and not just a participant. Right? So the pulpit's not the only place that teaching happens in our church. Look what the Bible says here in Titus 2. <clears throat> How teaching should just happen within the church. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged man be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Right? So we're not only just teaching when we think about teaching is, I'm just teaching you what I know. I'm teaching you by my example as well. You say, like, how should I live as a Christian? How should I behave? How should I talk? Well, follow my example. Can you say that about yourself? So we see here the aged men 
and we'll see later how it mentions the younger men. But here, verse 3, the aged women likewise, <clears throat> that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women. You see here, there's a teaching going on to pass on the knowledge, to encourage the younger generation to follow God's word, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. Right? Discreet means that you're not overly loud right? and out there. To be discreet. Chase. Right? Chase means you're pure. So are you pure? You also look pure. You want to dress pure as well. You want people to look at you, not just say people pure, and then you dress like immodestly. You want to be chaste in the way you appear as well. Keepers at home. Well, that's not a popular. None of these are popular today. But, you know, in God's house, they ought to be popular. These ought to be things where we look at them and don't think, oh, you know, why is the church so patriarchal? We should be glorifying these things and realizing, hey, these are good attributes for women to have and that God wants them to have. Discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. If the word of God be not blasphemed. You see here, when you're not these things, you know, the word of God can be blasphemed. And it's not just for the women, but the men also. Right? So remember how we talked about at the beginning. If you don't gather with Jesus Christ, you scatter. You know, you can see here that if we don't strive to be men and women of godly Christian character, it says here that the word of God can be blasphemed. Young men likewise. So you see how the older generation is teaching the younger generation? Likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So you see our example here. You know, and unless you're like, you know, the youngest kids in the church, everybody can be a good example here. You know, the older kids can be a good example to the younger kids. The teenagers can be a good example to the, you know, the older kids. And then the young adults be a good example to the teenagers. And the adults be a good example to the young adults. And the grandparents, good example to the parents. And likewise. So you see how we can always teach by the things we know, obviously by God's word, and by our own example. Right, so we want to make sure we're teaching. <laughs> Look at what it says here in Romans 15, 14. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another, right? And the last verse I want to just, uh, last two verses I want to show you here is in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. So be a teacher at church, you know, amongst people, you know, know what you're talking about. But here, importantly as well, that we teach our children. We make sure we teach our children the ways of God. Right? Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. You see how it starts with you. You need to know first before you're going to teach. Right? But you want to grow to be a teacher. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. You see how here teaching is not just an event, right? It's a lifestyle. You know, your life ought to be a lesson to somebody else about how to live for God. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine head, hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. You see, the word of God is in every aspect of your life as you rise up, as you walk by the way. They're all over the place. That's how involved your life should be with the Word of God. And just the last passage on this point, Deuteronomy 4. Not only do we want to teach our children, but we want to make sure we're teaching our children's children as well. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. All right, so just in conclusion, Matthew 12, 30. 
just going back to the beginning. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth, gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So we don't, there is no middle ground in the Christian life. You know, you want to be, you want to be a blessing to this church, you need to make sure you're moving forward, because if you don't, you're going to be going backwards, and you're going to be pulling people back with you, right? So if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards, and that's how it can work in the church. So five things in summary. You want to be righteous, be committed, be a soul winner, and be a friend, and be a teacher. All right? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate six years together. And I uh, pray, Lord, that you'll use our church to do great things for you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for encouraging us, exhorting us, rebuking us. Uh, help us, Lord, to cut out the sin out of our life and help us, Lord, to constantly move forward. Help us to be an edifying force in the church and rather than a destructive force. Help us to gather with you, not scatter. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.